Hello, welcome to Survivor Jive. One request I get more than any other is for a reading list. People ask me to tell them what books I've read that help me to know what I know and what books they can read so they can start their path of discovery and learning. And this makes me very happy because I want these videos to inspire people to learn more. But I've never bothered to make a video like this because I didn't really think it would be a very interesting video. And the only reason I'm doing it is because I have had so many requests. Uh, it's quite astounding. No one uh, has consistently made any other request like this. Always, always, always people ask me for book recommendations. So here it is, the Survive the Dive book reading list. Um, one of the most common requests for reading lists is for Anglo-Saxon paganism. So for those, I'll begin for you to, by saying that there aren't that many books exclusively on Anglo-Saxon paganism. The way that people understand Anglo-Saxon paganism is by reading Norse about Norse paganism, about Germanic paganism in general, and then by reading um, some old English literature, and then trying to fill in the gaps, and also by looking at archaeology and seeing what we can tell. And there's a lot of essays, lots and lots of great essays on these. That's how I learned a lot when I was at university, studying my masters. However, I'll give you three examples of books. If you just want a book uh, on the subject, there are three great books that you might look at. Number one, David Raoul Wilson. The title of the book is Anglo-Saxon Paganism, published by London Rootledge in 1992. You'll see this in the references to my essays on Anglo-Saxon Paganism. My essays, if you have not read them, are available on medievalist.net and on academia.edu. My name's Tom Rousel. If you try Googling, then you'll find them. I have one called Riding to the Afterlife. It's my dissertation on horses in Germanic Paganism. I have another called Woden and his roles in Anglo-Saxon genealogies. And I have one called Against the Heathen, the, the, the role of pagan characters in um, ha uh, Anglo-Saxon hagiographies. Anyway, I mean, this book by uh, Wilson is very useful. It was helpful for me. It has a lot of the different information all in one source. So good book if you can get a copy. You might not be able to buy a copy. Uh, but otherwise, do look in your library. Libraries are your friend. That is where you will find a lot of the best books and you don't necessarily uh, have to buy it because bookshops don't always stock actually the best books. They just stock the ones that they think they can sell. Libraries stock the best books, especially if, you go, if you're in a big city or you're near a university and you can get access to the library, then I recommend you spend hours in there. Number two, uh, William Cheney. The book is called The Cult of Kingship in Anglo-Saxon England, The Transition from Paganism to Christianity, published by Manchester University Tr uh, Press in 1970. Another great book. Number three, Richard North, titled Heathen Gods in Old English Literature, Cambridge University Press, 1997. This was written by my professor during my master's degree. I uh, found his advice very helpful. This book looks almost entirely at historical sources, not at archaeology, not really at, uh, at, at, at other things. It just looking at literature of old English. It occasionally refers to um, Icelandic literature and other literature for reference, but it's really looking at what we can know about Anglo-Saxon paganism by looking at the Christian Anglo-Saxon literary sources. And it's very interesting indeed. A uh, great insight into Anglo-Saxon culture. Uh, highly recommend that book. So what if you want to just know about paganism in general? Well, if you want to know about paganism in general, then you don't have to worry so much about the latest essays and stuff where people are discussing it, because that's, you know, I find that more interesting. If you just want a book to get a, an overall view. It doesn't have to be that recent. And that is why I recommend Hilda Ellis Davidson. Any book by her is good, but I particularly like Gods and Myth of Northern Europe uh, by Penguin, uh, published in 1964. So it's old. But it doesn't mean it's outdated. It's got some great stuff in there. Um, really good uh, insight into Germanic world and, and the Germanic worldview of these pagans. She is, for a historian, someone who has a really good understanding of uh, metaphysics and, and what that worldview might be like. If you want to go into something a little bit more 
left field, then you could also check out Maria Phil Hogg's uh, book, the, the Seed of Yggdrasil. Um, and I did a full review on that in another video, so you can watch that video if you want. Um, and she, as well, she does, she does an esoteric analysis of, uh, of Old Norse paganism uh, and Old Norse sources, so you can get really into the nitty-gritty of the matter. Recommend it. Or if you don't want to buy a book, at least subscribe to her channel, The Lady of the Labyrinth, because it's worth doing. Uh, another book uh, that I did refer to occasionally when I was at uni is uh, Christopher Abram, The Myths of the Pagan North, published in 2011. So it's reasonably recent and a good sort of just... It's a, good, it's a good book. It's got a lot of stuff and it's got, you know, like, it's for you could introduce yourself to this topic, but it goes into uh, quite good depth. Uh, published uh, Continuum Press in London. Worth looking for. Then again, if you don't want to look through historians and, and uh, analyses of these sources, you could just buy the primary sources yourself. Uh, I think that's actually a very good idea that you should do that. Um, of course, there are. there's always the chance, and I see a lot of that, that people come and comment on my video when they've read a primary source and they've taken something literally that, uh, literally that no historian has ever taken literally because you must understand the historic context in which it was written and who it was written by. So on the one hand, I recommend that you do read the primary sources, but on the other, I think that you should um, listen to the experts when they, uh, when they have another, they have information on how those sources should be interpreted. But Here's some uh, examples of the primary sources I ex expect you should all read. Beginning with the most important of all primary sources in European paganism. In fact, not just that, it's probably one of the most important source, uh, literary examples. If you study literature or if you're interested in literature, you should have read this. If you study poetry, you should have read this. If you study philosophy, you should have read this. If you study anything to do with Europe or if you're interested in Europe and you want to know about Europe, then you should know that this, the beginning of the Western canon, Homer, you must read the Iliad and the Odyssey. Every European should have read that. It, it used to be the case that any man of letters, any educated person would have read Homer. Now it isn't. That's a shame. It, it really is the origin of uh, the beginning of European culture in written form. So read that heroic epic. It's great. It's fun to read. And it's, uh, and it's surprisingly familiar. It really is. Uh, it, the, all the truths in it ring true in our culture. That it's just, um, and in many other cultures around the world as well. It, it's a it's a heroic epic. Uh, it reminds me of Beowulf. There's another one you should all read as well. You should all read Beowulf. Try Seamus Heaney's translation if you want a fun one. Uh, I heard Tolkien's translation is okay too. I've not read it, but um, uh, also if you on the subject, if you're going back to the classical. This one's worth checking out. Not as important to read as Homer, but still, you must read it, I think. This is uh, Virgil the Enid, and he, a Roman author, very influenced by Homer, clearly. Um, it's also on the same topics, the Trojan Wars, but he's bringing it all into a, the context of, like, the ancestors of the Romans. The Romans believed the Trojans to be their ancestors and the founders of Rome. Uh, it gives you some insight into paganism of the time. It's great, and it's heroic as well. That's what we like. Um, going into Germanic sources, of course, the Eddas. You must read the Eddas. The Prose Edda, um, there's many translations. I, I, I read one by Bayok, published in uh, 1970. I read a more childish one by Kevin Crossley Hollins. It's appropriate for uh, reading to children. Perfectly good. I gather that Jack, uh, Jackson Crawford, the YouTuber, has done one recently. And for all I know, that might be very good. I haven't read it. Uh, really, just find any translation. I'm sure they're all good. Um, anything's better than nothing. Then there's the Poetic Edda, also known as the Elder Edda. Um, that, I think, that tra the translation matters more there because uh, you're taking a balance between readability, making it actually intelligible to you, and also preserving the original feeling of the, the meter of the poems themselves, which uh, quite, uh, quite beautiful. I, I love that. And I think that's important to preserve that because you want to get a feel for how the poetry felt, but if you also want to be able to just perceive what was being said. It's a bit cryptic otherwise. Anyway, I enjoyed um, Andy Orchard's translation from 2011, published by uh, Penguin Classics, so I can recommend that one. Um, other Norse sources, though, besides the sagas, there are tons of sagas. Read any of them. I, I mean, Njal Saga's great. Egil Saga's great. Egil Saga's got some examples of Odinic belief in it. Uh, the, uh, the Orkney Saga, the Pharaoh Saga. Oh, there's tons of them. I mean, um, I've never read one I didn't like. Um, 
also Hemskringler. Here's uh, volume two. Uh, volume one is especially good. It's got stuff about paganism in it. You get some insight into the pagans of the time. I've referred to it in some of my videos. I, um, uh, this is volume two where it talks more about uh, St. Oliver Haraldson. Um, not sure if it's in focus. Well, yeah, get a copy of Hemskringler. Uh, the version, I got volume one and two published by the Viking Society for Northern Research, which is part, which is a division of my old university, Univ uh, University College London. Uh, I don't know what other translations exist. In fact, I think this was, in 2011, this was one of the only ones around. Um, but whatever, find whatever one you can. Sometimes you can just get some dodgy translations on the internet. They're not great, but like just read it. Um, another primary source, uh, Laknunga, Book of Poems. That's where that woven charm for the Nine Herbs charm I've talked about in From Runes to Ruins. Where, uh, it's actually a book of magic spells. Some of them refer to pagan gods like Woden. A lot of them are Christian spells. A lot of them are more obscure. You're not sure what they are. Some of them even invoke uh, Irish pagan uh, customs. Um, it was written in the 10th century, but um, I read a, a 1952 publication called uh, Anglo-Saxon Magic and Medicine, illustrated specially from the semi-pagan text Laknunga. So it was interpreting some of the text, and it was written by uh, Grattan, who did the translations, uh, published at Oxford University Press. So yeah, worth a look if you're into magic and spells and things like that. That's a primary source. Um, the oldest primary source on Germanic culture is probably um, Cornelius Tacitus, a uh, Roman historian uh, in the book The Agricola and the Germania. Uh, I read a translation by Mattingly, published by Penguin in 1970. Uh, read Tacitus is great. I really think it's uh, such a great insight into the, the world at that time, around 2000 years ago. And it should be noted though, please, that Tacitus is primarily a good way for us to understand how Romans saw other people, not for exactly how those people were, because you, there's only so much you can trust him. I'm sure that there's a lot you can trust, but it has to be, you have to interpret these texts. The other thing people ask me about is, because I do a lot of videos now about Indo-Europeans. Well, how, how did I learn about Indo-Europeans, people ask. Did, what books did I read? Well, I never, I've only actually read one book specifically about Indo-Europeans as a whole. I've read lots of books about Indo-European paganism, but you read one about Hinduism, you read one about Norse mythology, you read these different, and then you piece them together yourself and you can get a feeling for Indo-European culture. But um, if you want a book that really, I mean, one that I read that really gets to the root of it and also talks about how the archeological uh, evidence points towards the Proto-Indo-Europeans, then I recommend The Horse, The Wheel and Language, How Bronze Age Riders from the Eurasian Steppes Shaped the Modern World. That is by David W. Anthony. And he is one of the foremost uh, scholars in this field of uh, Indo-European studies. Another is uh, the Irishman, James Patrick Mallory. Uh, definitely worth reading um, a lot of his stuff. Also, both Mallory and Anthony have uh, lectures up on YouTube, so just Google those. The other, another great name in this field is Georges Dumasil, and he is more based on the analysis of the mythology and the worldview of the Indo-European people, the Proto-Indo-Europeans. He was the one who came up with the tripartite hypothesis about uh, how they often have three gods and how uh, the society is divided into three castes and things like that. Uh, he's been around for much longer. He's, he's an older scholar in the field um, and probably one of the biggest names in it. Um, but he has more insight into the metaphysics of the Indo-European worldview. Now, if you really want to get into metaphysics, then you've got to move beyond books by historians and mainstream scholars and go into more obscure territory which is what I do, and that is why I have a great interest in the traditionalist school, aka the uh, perennial school. These people don't just compare Indo-European religions to find out the common truth between them. They compare all religions. They actually believed in a primordial truth that unites all religions, uh, which is uh, exemplary in um, Friedrich Schoen, German author's book, uh, The Transcendental Unity of, of Religions. But... Um, to begin with, I think if you're new to that school, then you should probably read the first book in that um, discipline, 
It's called Introduction to the Study of the Hindu Doctrines, but it would be, uh, it's a bit of a misleading title. I think it should be more accurately called Introduction to Radical Traditionalism and the Worldview, because a lot of it isn't even talking about Hinduism, it's just criticizing Western biases, Orientalism, and the, the, the biases of progressive modern Westerners that prevent us from understanding the Eastern traditions, Buddhism, uh, and Hinduism, and also he was a big fan of Islam. Uh, he started off interested in Hinduism. He was a Catholic when, he, and this was published initially by a Catholic uh, press, but he later uh, became a Muslim, a Sufi Muslim in Egypt. Other uh, traditionalists, uh, one who I've been very influenced by, uh, Julius Evola. Um, Julius Evola wrote on all kinds of stuff. I mean, his most famous works are um, his main, uh, his magnum opus is. Uh, Revolt Against the Modern World, and he did follow up later with some themes after the war in uh, Ride the Tiger. But if you want to just get into the metaphysics, you might look at... I mean, I enjoyed this one I made a video about called um, The Doctrine of Awakening, where he looks at uh, Buddhism and the core uh, metaphysical meaning of it. And um, this is a bit like what uh, Ganon was doing with um, Hinduism, except Ganon was a bit critical of Buddhism. And he remained so until um, Kumaraswamy, uh, who was a born a Sri Lankan Buddhist, wrote this book, uh, Hindus and Buddhists. Kumaraswamy was a, a Sri Lankan traditionalist who later converted to Catholicism, I believe, and married an English woman. But um, he, uh, he was maintaining that Buddhism and Hinduism both uh, referred to primordial truth, uh, the true tradition. And... Um, Whereas Gunon had previously been quite critical of Buddhism, thinking it a diversion from the original uh, tradition uh, of Hinduism. Uh, and Avola definitely didn't think that. Avola thought uh, 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 the, uh, the Buddhism was a very noble religion, uh, or an, an, a non-superstitious one, and very suitable, he thought, for certain differentiated individuals of our time. Um, Avola also talks about some, in other books, he talks about all kinds of things, Roman paganism, Norse paganism, Mexican, uh, Aztec paganism, whereas Gunon, who had a bias against Europeans in general, uh, to the extent, with the exception of Roman Catholicism in the Middle Ages, which he thought was the high point of European culture, he thought that the Greeks and the Romans were quite uh, metaphysically inferior to Eastern cultures, such as the Persians. But that's not what Julius Evola thought. Um, Julius Avila is very interested in Roman paganism. He lived in Rome and he was uh, an Italian, so he had uh, perhaps a bias towards it, but he was fascinated by it and he saw it as preserving some of these ancient Indo-European noble warrior traditions. That's what also made him interested in Norse uh, mythology to a certain extent. He wasn't hugely knowledgeable about Norse mythology, but he's very knowledgeable about many different traditions and he was... Uh, Extreme, extremely insightful on metaphysics in general. So um, I would recommend looking, he also talks about, for example, uh, in this one, The Mystery of the Grail, he talks about the, the esoteric secrets of Christianity and, uh, and medieval Christianity. And uh, there's Metaphysics of War, where he talks about warrior traditions in all kinds of religions, including Islam, Christianity and paganism, in Norse mythology. But uh, it should be noted that Julius Evola, René Ganon, Great to read, great to get a proper insight into what the worldview was of religious traditional societies in ancient times, because we have moved so far from that, that we can hardly even conceive of, of, of the world the way they perceived it. But I, I would warn you that the these gentlemen, very wise and knowledgeable men who have written very useful things and help us to uh, to get to adopt this traditionalist mindset but they did make a lot of mistakes about different things because they um, sometimes they weren't in possession of the knowledge that we have what DNA evidence has shown us about ancient migrations uh, what we've proven in terms of linguistics for example uh, Gunon didn't even believe that there was a, a, a proto-Indo-European uh, people who m moved into uh, India and founded Hinduism and Evola believed that there was but he also believed some funny things about them uh, that were wrong um, for example he got his Evola is very hung up on the solar versus lunar the solar uh, patriarchal uh, uh, spirituality that was supplanted by 
uh, a more telluric lunar and feminine um, spirituality in his view. But of course, in, in actual, uh, as I said before in other videos, the actual European, proto-Indo-European religion had a, a feminine solar and a, a masculine lunar. Uh, so he got that wrong. But it doesn't matter when they get things like that wrong because the core message of their, uh, of their ideas about metaphysics is still true. Likewise, when we're reading the more um, widely accepted scholars like um, David Anthony and uh, James Patrick Mallory, you can disregard some things they say which are politically motivated and modernist and don't appreciate uh, some other facts that have emerged. And also, they really don't fully understand the worldview of uh, a traditional society because uh, it's very hard for most people to imagine today. So I've given you some books to read through and uh, I hope this is going to be helpful. Um, I probably won't ever do one of these again, but remember to follow the breadcrumbs in the references. If you find an interesting part of a book, look at the reference in the back or at the footnotes and then get that book too and keep following on and expanding your knowledge in that way. Anyway, thanks for listening to Survive the Jive. Don't forget to check out some of my essays that are online. Bye.